Thank you, Walter. Oh, as always, a very elegant uh, and warm and inviting uh, introduction. Uh, splendid. It's my pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for making time. I know you're squeezed. It's the end of the semester. <clears throat> Every time I get to this play, my hair uh, catches on fire, and that's why um, I mean, this is so powerful and so moving. You think I'm joking. I know. But that's how I've lost my hair. I just, this is not an affectation. It's Lear who did it to me. It's like with Shakespeare. So, uh, I call it a narrative of death and dying. 400 years of reader and audience response to Shakespeare's King Lear reveal the power of the play to evoke fundamental existential questions about life and death. Why must I suffer? Why must I lose? all the things I have come to love, and why must I die? Lear's untamed responses to the impending conditions of life bring inconsolable suffering upon him and all who inhabit his world, ripping the tendons of family and individual life and shattering inherited beliefs of a coherent universe. Since the play's publication in 1605, artists the world over in every medium have been provoked to respond to the tragic events of the play. John Keats' poem, <clears throat> on sitting down to read Shakespeare's King Lear once again in the 19th century is such an example. A jewel for once again the fierce dispute betwixt damnation and impassioned clay must I burn through once more, humbly essay the bittersweet of this Shakespearean fruit. Keat identifies the emotional turbulence the play awakens in him and the fierce dispute it provokes, distressing questions about human beings and their capacity for inflicting horror upon others, including themselves. In 1789, oh, there it is. In 1789, uh, William Blake's uh, watercolor, Lear and Cordelia in Prison, captures an extraordinary moment in Act Five of the play. Lear and Cordelia and her army from France have been defeated by the antagonist and are imprisoned. Just moments before, Lear had recovered from his mad ravings on the heath and calmness replaces his mental chaos. Even more, Lear has experienced, it seems, for the first time, the unconditional love of the youngest daughter, Cordelia. She whom he had damaged early in the play by banishment. Lear is euphoric as he goes off to prison because he will be with the only daughter who has loved him throughout his ordeal. What matters to him more than anything is being with her. No matter their confinement in a prison, where Lear believes erroneously they will remain undistracted by the clamor of the world. In this watercolor, color, Blake captures the contrasting and deeply sorrowful moment for Cordelia. She is pensive as Lear rests contentedly like a small child, an inverted pietà, snuggling with his head resting in her maternal lap. Blake captures Cordelia's profound grief over Lear's suffering and the terrible knowledge she has that they will soon be, be murdered. In addition to the verbal, art, uh, the verbal art of Keats and visual art of Blake, uh, in the musical idiom, uh, two composers ha have been inspired to stage the story of Lear. In the 19th century, Giuseppe Verdi's fascination with Shakespeare led to his attempt to write the opera King Lear to follow upon his success with his operas of Macbeth and Otello. Though finally incomplete, Verdi struggled for years to bring Lear to fruition, but was overwhelmed by its power and unable to complete the work. In the 20th century, uh, Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich wrote the film score to Gregorio Kosintsev's Kid O' Lear, King Lear, in 1971. Contemporary American novelist Jane Smiley published A Thousand Acres, based upon King Lear. Smiley writes that she is offended by Shakespeare's presentation of Goneril and Reagan as the evil sisters. 
She argues that in the scenes where they talk between themselves about Lear's unruly actions and his drunken nights, they were responding in the way most women would have responded to the turmoil these men produced. Smiley felt Shakespeare seemed to be condemning the sisters morally for the exact ways in which they express their womanhood. The writer takes the Lear story in another direction as she translates Shakespeare's love auction into incest between the father and the two older daughters. Smiley, uh, Smiley's daughters burn angrily as their father, at their father, not only for his in, impulsive decision to divide their property and inheritance, but also for his sexual abuse of them. Critics of the play, overwhelmed by its unremitting agony, have attempted to revise Shakespeare to wind down its, its turbulence and unenviable and ultimately doomed ambition. None of the revisions has endured, and the original Shakespeare has always been restored each time. In 1681, Nahum changed the ending where Cordelia is not murdered but survives, marries Edgar. That revision with a happy ending becomes the only stage version of the play for over a century. In the 19th century, however, British actor William McCready returns to Shakespeare's original text, though Victorian productions for a time continue to, to omit the eye gouging of Gloucester because of its terrifying savagery. 18th century writer Samuel Johnson was so shocked by Cordelia's death that he was unable to read the play again until he had, had revised it as the editor of all of Shakespeare's plays. Johnson's edition of the complete works of Shakespeare was published in 1756, and today these volumes may be found in antiquarian archives, but unused in contemporary publications of the plays or theatrical productions. In the 20th century, A.C. Bradley, renowned critic and editor of Shakespeare's plays, observed that the gouging of Gloucester's eyes was a flaw in Shakespeare's writing. And what the play needed after the deaths of the villains, Edmund Goneril and Reagan, was the escape from death of Lear and Cordelia. So he suggested that the ending be changed to allow Cordelia to marry Edgar so that the audience could imagine the poor old king living quietly and safely in the humble home of his beloved child until he dies. It's just really extraordinary that people, people were audacious enough to think they could mm, improve Shakespeare. Uh, other critics deal with the play through the prism of their own ideologies. Anthony Parr, for instance, in 2011, uses a play as a frame through which to view climate change. The threat of environmental catastrophe is more in tune with the, in, with the intimations of apocalypse, apocalypse in King Lear than were the global threats of the late 20th century from the former Soviet Union. Oliver Ford Davis in 2003 offers a feminist reading of Lear as a misogynist who expresses loathing at his daughter's reproductive physiology. Arnold Kettle in 1964 argues for a Marxist reading of the play with Edmund the villain as the new man of an incipient bourgeoisie revolution engaged in corruption of private enterprise. What unites all of these responses to the play is the urge to revise Shakespeare, the Lear story, or replace it with the reader's own story of how things should turn out. Mm -hmm. In this sense, the critical response to the play is not analytical, but narratological. The reader substitutes his story while deleting Shakespeare's original narrative of Lear. Shakespeare's story of the 8th century folk legend of King Lear unveils something wildly disturbing in its cracking of familial and, and domestic bonds, of violating traditional codes of governing and methods of transmitting power. And most important of all, I think, of excavating philosophical anxieties regarding the end of life and death. Shakespeare has dramatized something that ignites a primeval dread in people, a dread of having to do with the disintegration of the orderly structures of life, the guard against the desolation and loss of all that is perceived as valuable and meaningful. Every relationship ends. It ends in death or it ends in separation, but it ends in Shakespeare's world. To get at the way stories function, specifically in this play, I want to turn to the work of cognitive psychologist Jerome Bruner and his notion of narrative as subjunctivization. 
narrative begins, as Bruno reminds us in Aristotle's Peripatia, the sudden reversal of circumstances. The story begins when we are thrown out of the banality of everyday life. The ordinary formulations of social exchange and familiar social custom stabilize our lives and leave us with a sense of predictability and control. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. And how are you? Fine, thanks. Have a nice day. Have a blessed day. Take care now. And so on. When reversals disrupt the routine round of events and performances that make up daily life, then these banal expressions may become strange, confusing, and even at times abhorrent. The reversal challenges our epistemology. What we thought we knew is shaken. What we took for granted slips away. The order we give to our lives is revealed as fragile, and the best laid plans fracture. Perpetia sweeps us into another mode of knowing the world, what Brunner calls subjunctivization. The subjunctive mode of discourse is contrary to fact. It is the domain of possibilities and raises the question, what if? Then what? Narrative knowledge focuses on subjunctivizing experience and opens on to fictitious states of being, entertaining the possible rather than engaging the actual. The, 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 the drama begins at once in Peripatia. Lear's abdication is a stunning reversal of circumstances for all the characters in the play. It is the central episode in the play that sets the tragedy in motion. The reversal occurs immediately at the opening of, in Act One and Scene One, as Lear gathers counselors and visitors in the court to divulge his darker purpose. Um, know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and it is our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths while we unburdened crawl toward death. Lear seems to say here that relieved of his governing responsibilities, he will withdraw from active life and devote the rest of his life to reflections upon mortality. He seems to have accepted his own death as inevitable and wants to devote the remaining time he has to preparing for the end. When Lear announces that he will abdicate and divide the kingdom, peripatia occurs. It is Lear himself who initiates the reversals. The Aristotelian notion of peripatia includes both human agency and natural force. Circumstances can be reversed by, by circumstances can be reversed by processes unfolding in nature as well as decisions made by people. Lear's method of transmitting power and inheritance seems impulsive, however, a flash of fear more than rational decision making. Lear will base his transfer of power and real estate upon a verbal game of caprice, a love auction that commodifies love, rather than upon a traditional set of ancient legal practices enacted in formulaic rituals. Lear requires that each daughter compete publicly in an oratorical contest to surpass the other in expression of love for him. Lear disregards cultural facts, the social imperatives that make up English law, the, like belief in absolute monarchy, deemed necessary for maintaining human society. In its place, Lear raises the possibility, what if, what if I retire? What if I give up my obligations as king? Then. I can delegate the boring administrative responsibilities like securing safety and health for citizens, maintaining economic and other institutional systems of control. But at the same time, I can retain my prerogatives, my privileges, my prestige, my power, my control. Then I can continue to live as I have always lived, a mighty king, every inch a king, he said. Then my life will continue healthy, no medical interruptions, even though he's over 80 years old. No losses. Things will go on the way they always have, and I'll still be king. Abdication is seductive. Pushes Lear to make foolish decisions that unleash chaos in the realm and ultimately precipitate the betrayals, mutilations, amputations, and murders. 
Everyone close to Lear is affected by his subjunctivizing. This passage suggests that Lear seems to have come to terms with his own mortality. After all, he is in his late 80s. Eric Erickson, great, a great psychologist, Eric Erickson, who um, developed an original model of life phase development, talks about the crisis of death that everybody faces. Everybody faces, everybody confronts the crisis of, 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 um, of death, but not everybody is successful in, in negotiating it. So here he is saying, um, I want to relinquish my kingdom and an unburdened crawl toward death. Um, he says his retirement will release these administrative burdens free him to crawl, that is, move toward accepting the um, psychological and physical decline in functionality that usually accompanies uh, the end of life. So why does he set up the love auction? Which of you shall we say doth love us most, that we with wisest bounty may extend? And why is he pleased with his two oldest daughters' preposterous, hyperbolic declarations of love? Goneril says this, Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter, dearer than eyesight, space, liberty, beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child ere love the father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, beyond all manner of so much I love you. And he buys it. And her sweet sister, Reagan, Sir, Daddy, I am made of the self-same metal that my sister is and drives me in her word. In my true heart I find she names my very deed of love. Oh, to have a sister like this. Only she comes too short. That I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses and find I am alone. Felicitate in your dear highness love. It's the only thing, Daddy, that makes me happy, being next to you. People are looking around, and Lear is pleased. Is pleased. Why? When Cordelia refuses to enter the contest, what of you, Lear asks her to say, to draw a third more opulent than your sister? And she says, Nothing. And Lear is stunned. Nothing, nothing will come of nothing. Speak again, lest you may mar your fortune. Baby, this is your chance. Don't let it pass you by. What hyperbole does is to assert this falsehood. Without Lear as king, there would be no life for these sisters, and by implication, no life for anyone. This is a subjunctivization of Goneril and Reagan. In other words, if Lear were to die, the world would collapse. Life would end. The declarations of both Goneril and Reagan are meant to reassure Lear that he is safe from death and that he is not a replaceable inhabitant on planet Earth, but rather a necessary being who is protected from death. Lear gets what he wants from Goneril and Reagan, reassurance that death is not near him. And in this, and in his fear of death, he takes assurance that is quickly revoked when Cordelia refuses to play the game of love. The offense is more stinging than when his favorite child, Cordelia, refuses to play. Her plain speaking is a thinly disguised rebuke of the whole unhappy charade. As she says, unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more, no less. Cordelia's refusal to enter into sibling competition stuns Lear. Enraged, he banishes Cordelia and her defendant Kent and divides his kingdom into two parts for his seemingly compliant daughters, Goneril and Maria. Lear enters the subjunctive mode of discourse. Early retirement is coupled with early distribution of children's inheritance. Efficient? Maybe. Effective? No. Disastrous? 
Yes. Lear himself admits, a darker purpose, conscious that he strays from hollow tradition. The British cornerstone believed that a king is responsible for his whole life as the leader of the British people and as God's <coughs> lieutenant on earth. At least Lear signals that he knows he deviates from customary practice. Yet he seems relieved by Goneril and Reagan's preposterous declarations of filial love. Lear's subjunctivizing unleashes forces that undermine the anchors of his social world. What if questions can summon unanticipated realities? If Lear abdicates, anarchy rather than monarchy may reign. If Lear abdicates, securing his daughter's vows of love may not be sufficient to, to tame their voracious appetites for power. So that, as he says, I want you to have the money now, the property now, so there won't be any conflict in the future. That's his justification. In Shakespeare's King Lear, every character is thrown into the narrative mode, struggling to make sense of the reversal of circumstances and expectations in Lear's abdication and division of the kingdom, and give coherence to its unsettling implications. Lear fe fails to recognize that his, his subjunctivizing provokes ruminations of possibilities in others, particularly in his daughters, their husbands, his friend and counselor Gloucester, and, his illeg and Gloucester's illegitimate bastard son, Edmund. Moreover, Lear, Lear fails to recognize the power of subject subjectivity. In the grammar of motives, the conclusion of the subjunctive clause, what if, is a series of possibilities that are not self-evident, especially to Lear himself. Is what if I abdicate? may catalyze this predicate, then I cannot live forever. So how can I abdicate and still be king? Cordelia's, what if I am denied a dowry and exiled by my father, ends with, then who will marry me? And where will I live? Goneril and Regan subjunct subjunct subjunctivizing, what if my father exiles his favorite daughter, Cordelia, then what will become of me? And later, what if my father is senile? Cognitive dissonance, early onset of Alzheimer's. Who but I should take his place and be the ruler? And still later, Goneril uh, subjunctivizes, what if my husband were out of the way? And what if my sister were out of the way? Then I could marry my true love, the love of my life, Edmund, and become queen. Edmund, the villain, and I think um, one can make a very good case that Edmund and Iago are perhaps, Edmund, Iago, and Richard III are the, the, um, the great villains uh, in, in Shakespeare. Edmund's subjunctivizing is most dangerous because it is responsible for the death and the mutilation in the play. His beginning narrative of deception slides easily into betrayal and murder. What if, in the first speech, thou nature or my goddess to thy laws, my services are bound, and he is overdetermined by his, by his uh, fixation on his bastardy, on his, on his illegitimacy. So he begins to think, he subjunctivized in that, even in that very first soliloquy, what if I can alienate my father from my brother, then I, a bastard, can inherit my legitimate brother's wealth. And still later, what if I can reveal my father a traitor? And what if I can manipulate Reagan and Goneril? They both love me. Hmm, which one will I have? I'm not sure yet. Let's see if I can manipulate them into killing yeah? my father. Then I will become, I will have my father's title, the Earl of Gloucester. Again later, what if I can possess one of Lear's daughters, and what if I can set them against each other, and what if I can get Lear and his daughter out of the way? Then I shall be king. So the full conjugation of uh, the uh, path to power. Um, in um, 
Shakespeare's King Lear, every character is thrown into the narrative or this, or this uh, subjunctive mode, struggling to make sense of the reversals of circumstance and expectations in Lear's abdication and division of the kingdom and give coherence to its unsettling implication. <coughs> Lear feels to fails to recognize that his subjunctivizing provokes ruminations of possibilities in others, particularly in his daughters, their husbands, his friend and counselor, Gausler, Gloucester and illegitimate son. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. To understand Edmund's subjunctivizing is to understand its transgressive power. Edmund regards custom as pollution that kills natural impulses and marginalizes those noble savages most fit for survival. In Edmund's narrative, uh, he betrays all life-sustaining bonds, axiomatic bonds of family, volitional bonds of loyalty to the king, even the bond of fidelity in intimate relationships. Edmund listens only to his own voice. The story of power he narrates alienates him from conversations of morality and Renaissance practices of civil life. Edmund's subjunctivizing, like Lear's, results in isolation. In particular, Lear's, na Lear's narrative disrupts the legitimizing sources of identity and authority. Lear's monarchy is narratively constructed. It is the stories that Lear she shares with other human beings, stories that embed the history of their social life as well as dramatize the traditions that endow their lives with coherence, that incorporates Lear and, as king and fellow human being into his culture. Human beings are narratively constituted in communities of practice and desire. We live our lives as stories that situate us in networks of relationships or, or, or in confines of solitude. Lear's subjunctivizing removes him from community because he excludes the voices which would challenge his story of possibilities. There are three, three transforming moments in the play. I want to pause to explore. In Act 3, Scene 4, On the Heath and the Raging Storm, that invades us to the skin. Kent invites Lear. Kent invites Lear. 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 Lear which for me is a, is a wonderful uh, metaphor for the, the categories Lear has used to, to understand life. And, and so he has this breakdown because the, his categories of right and wrong and justice um, and good and evil and so on uh, don't work. Broken. Collapsed. And so it can be read. The play is so rich you can read this as a psychotic episode or a full-blown, even, even look, at, uh, look at dimensions of pathology in Lear's behavior on the heath. Or you can see it uh, more metaphorically as a uh, uh, kind of epistemology, uh, a breakdown. You know, my, my formulas for survival, my philosophy of life no longer works doesn't help me to deal with the depth and the complexity of the problems I'm facing. So here he is on the heath. He has been turned out of doors. He has been exiled by his daughters. And he's there with um, Edgar, who is Gloucester's son, who is disguised as Mad Tom of Bedlam. In the background is Kent, also in disguise, and his fool right next to uh, Lear. And that um, is Ian McKellen's production. <coughs> McKellen, the great actor who, anybody know the great role that he was in? Dumbledore. Ian McKellen was Dumbledore in one or two Harry Potter movies. That's him on the right. Great Shakespearean actor. Um, and so there they are. Uh, they meet this guy who is hallucinating, Tom O'Bedlam, and uh, they're, they're in a storm. And this is a moment of transition, the beginning of a profound transformation in Lear, because for the first time in the play, Lear thinks of other people. For the first time in the play, he is urged, go in, my lord, go in, go into, go into the hut, go into the tent, 
get out of the storm, and he stops and says, you first. To all of you, I have taken too little care of this. As a king, I have not been sensitive to all of the poverty that's around me. And it's my responsibility as the chief executive of this uh, nation state. It was my responsibility, and I ignored it. I turned my back on it. And so there's the beginning of a turn, the beginning of a shift in here. Um, and uh, um, so th this is the first time in, in the play he expresses some compassion for other people and insists that they precede him into uh, And this is what he says, pray thee go in thy, pray thee go in thyself, um, pray thee go in thyself, um, seek thy own need. Yes. Poor naked wretches, where'er you are that do the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from sessions such as these? I have taken too little care of this. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, and thou may shake us the superflux to them, and show the heavens more just. In this moment, first time in the play, Lear recognizes his failure. I have taken too little care of this as a human being. I've ignored it. I've ignored the suffering of other people. Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist who has written about uh, mythology all over the world, finding common themes, says that we become human, we become human when our heart breaks open in compassion for the plight of another human being. That's the moment. My God. You know, it's, it's, it's a holiday time, and uh, you're probably getting what I'm getting in the mail, uh, all these solicitations for contributions to organizations that help people around the world. So you see people who are blind. You see people who have hair and lips. You see people, doctors without borders, and so on. Um, it come every day, sometimes you know, a, lot more than, a lot more than once a day. And so, you know, Lear, Lear has recycled the mail, he said, for a long time. Didn't mm -hmm. bother with it. Um, but here's a change, powerful change. Um, and, uh, and then a little later, he has another conversation, another powerful conversation, uh, metaphorically. He looks at Tom and says, Thou art the thing itself. An accommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Unaccommodated man. And he uses the metaphor of accommodation as in going to a hotel for, for a place, a safe place to stay, to be taken care of. Um, and so, um, it, it reflects Lear's expanding awareness that he has not, he has not provided accommodation for the, the people he is close to. He has not provided the, the space of safety for them, for them to be who they were. And of course, this is, this is also connected with the whole, the whole theme of hospitality. Hospitality. Uh, when you are, and, and hospitality is all over the world. Every culture shares um, uh, a high regard for hospitality. Why? Because in hospitality, what you are doing is saying, in this space where I'm sovereign, in my house, when you come into my house and I offer you hospitality, you are safe in here. You're physically safe. Nobody's going to hurt you in my house, physically but you are also safe psychologically and emotionally to be yourself. What does that mean? Etymologically, the word in English for host and guest is from the same Latin root, hostia. Host and guest uh, have a kind of reciprocal relationship. So when you're invited into someone's house and that person shows you hospitality, in the process of your expressing gratefulness for the hospitality, you become that person's host in the house. For example, you're, you're invited to dinner somewhere, and you go, and it's, you know, it's, 
It may even be a very modest house, but you notice something, a, a rug, an antique, uh, uh, something from even a souvenir <coughs> shop, and you say, my God, that is so clever, that is so funny, that you step out and, and point out something that you appreciate. And in doing so, you are saying, I am grateful that you invited me into your home. You have taken the time to make me feel comfortable. The word host, there's a further flourish here. It is so interesting. God, you can't escape it. The further flo uh, flourish here is that hostia also, <laughs> in addition to meaning uh, guest or host, also means enemy. What? What does that have to do? Just when you're being hospitable, what's that have to do with enemies? Sooner or later, the person you will host may say something that you disagree with. Something perhaps political. In that moment, you choose. You choose to stop being a host and say, well, you wouldn't do it as crudely as that. Get out of my house. But you have to make room for somebody to have a different point of view if you're interested in hospitality. So you're negotiating that always. It's never perfect, never perfect. You're not gonna have somebody who feels exactly the same way about, that you do about everything in the universe. And that's the critical moment where you say, this person's in my house. I'm making this person feel at home. You know, going all the way, all the way back to Homer and the whole notion of uh, the, the, the classical quest to be at home in the world. We live in a, in, in a scary world. And the classical impulse is to discover a way to be in the world and not be afraid all the time. Afraid that you're going to be killed, afraid that you're going to be hurt, afraid that you're going to be damaged. That's being at home in the world. It doesn't mean that you're reckless and you're not prudent and, and so on, but that was the impulse of classicism, going back to antiquity. So this is Lear, too. Accommodation. I want to feel like I'm rooted in this world. I want to feel connected to the world, connected to other people. And he's beginning to be aware of that. He's beginning to, to be aware of how starved his life has been as this um, affluent king who has had everything he's wanted whenever he wanted it. Uh, all his life, and he's facing death, and it's very hard. It's very hard for him. And so I see what Lear is facing in this play as the, as the crisis of death, psychologically. That it's going to end, and he can't. He can't. So he wants to surround himself with people who will reassure him everything's going to be all right. It's it's what we do when we go to a doctor. We want one conversation with the doctor. Only one conversation. You go to a doctor, you want the doctor to say, it's going to be all right. Take this pill, you've got this procedure, things will return to normal. It's what medical sociologists call the restoration narrative. Just tell me it's going to be fine, so I can go out and continue. And so that fiction applies to all of us, but one day, all of us will not get that fiction. All of us will have to face the end point, the end game. Nobody escapes. So here, it, it, here is Lear, Lear on this journey. Uh, and on the heath, he makes these profound discoveries. Um, when we are unaccommodated, when we are, when we are alienated from other people, when we are isolated from other people, we are like strangers in the world, and we haven't yet entered our human condition. We're still at a more primitive level, he's saying. Accommodation, hospitality, makes us human. Uh, here leaves insight into the need for, for material and spiritual accommodation or lodging that offers others a space of safety for being at home in a, temp in a tempestuous universe to be themselves. Lear gains insight into his own failure as king, as father, to provide a safe space for, Cordel for Cordelia to be the daughter he wanted, or for Kent to protest objections to Lear's behavior. It's interesting. Kent loves Lear. Kent is willing to die for Lear. 
when he sees, when Tent sees Lear buying this preposterous, hyperbolic declaration of love from the two daughters, he stops them and says, are, are you crazy? Are you crazy, Lear? Should, should Tent be unmannerly when Lear is mad? And Lear says, out! Go! You're gone! If you, if you remain here, you'll be executed. He cannot tolerate dissent. He wants only agreement. Agree with me. And I would argue that, that underneath that is this fear of facing the final point, facing death. It ends for everybody. Um, so that inability um, to grant accommodation or lodging or hospitality to people um, blocks Lear from seeing who the people around him really are. He doesn't can't make the distinction between his good daughter and, and these um, two daughters who, are, uh, who obviously don't love him and abuse him finally and exile him, throw him out into the storm. Um, in the beginning of Act 3, uh, the blind spot blocks Lear from seeing who the people around him are and recognizing the virtue and love of his daughter and the falseness and hatred of Donna and Reagan. The answer to the question comes in Act 5, Scene 3. Lear and Cordelia are defeated, sent by the triumphant Edmund to prison. Another sudden reversal of condition. Lear's circumstances have been reduced to their lowest level, yet Lear is joyful to be reconciled with his daughter. And this is just an extraordinary scene here, here. It's an amazing, amazing scene. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Amazing scene. They're going to go to prison. But he's so happy that he's, he's met up with the daughter whom he hurt, whom he exiled. And he says this. And let's away to prison. She's worried. She says, oh my God, we've lost the battle and now we're taken, we're taken prisoner. And Leah says, no, no, let's go to prison. We too will sing like birds in a cage. When thou dost ask me a blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear of rogues, talk of court news, and we'll talk with them too. Who loses, who wins, who's on, who's out? And take upon the mystery of things as if we were God spies, and we'll wear out in a wallet prison, packs and sex and great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. So here he's the, he has discovered his truth here. He has discovered what is important in his life, saying, I don't care. I don't care. He, he subjunctivizes. What if we go to prison? We can see it as a house of beauty where birds sing. We'll laugh at gilded butterflies. Who are the gilded butterflies? They're the people, they're the politicians who come to court and try to make their way into the inner circles, courtiers and all their sartorial splendor, uh, who live lives as superficial as, he says, butterflies, as uh, fragile as butterflies. And we will, Lear says, act as if we were inhabitants of another domain and spies for God. And then the critical lines. He says, when Cordelia asked to be blessed, I will kneel and ask for forgiveness. That this is extraordinary. Two things. Forgive and bless, he say, make up the critical values in this imprisoned environment. This is transformation transformation of consciousness here. Um, the central human enactments of forgiveness and blessing will define their way of being with each other as father and daughter. And this is how we'll be with each other. Uh, you'll want me to bless you and I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me for the, the bad things that I have done, the coarse things I've done, but also things that I do unconsciously that hurt you. I want you to know I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hurt you. Um, but this is interesting. Again, etymologically, blessing and blood derive from the same Anglo-Saxon root, 
Blood is the vital fluid that keeps the body alive. Blessing, and from the same root as blood, another invokes an intensification of aliveness, the life force inside a human being. Asking to be forgiven for all the hurt one has inflicted on another, even <coughs> unintentionally, renews the, the bonds of amity and intimacy. Those two acts, blessing and forgiving, bring relationships to life in all <clears throat> and transform the power in people to be responsive in all the aspects, the spaces, the moments before them. As Lear participates as a listener in the narrative of his daughter, he recognizes the human plight, the plight, in all the plots and counterplots of their lives. He, he, he beholds the peripatia, that recognition inspires the breaking open of his heart in compassion for other people. Um, so I think this is a, just a very, very powerful moment that he, he understands this. Uh, it's not forgiveness, uh, forgiveness in the sense of being burdened by guilt or um, regret, but it, 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 it's forgiveness in the sense of wanting to say, I want what is good for you because I love you. And if I hurt you, I want you to know that I'm sorry. I want you to know. And please forgive me. It's interesting. Palliative care physicians talk about the end of life as, a, as the final developmental stage of life. Um, and uh, it's just become a specialty, a subspecialty in, in, in medicine uh, in the last five years. Uh, before then, uh, the end of life represented failure. Doctors, we don't have any more medicine, no more surgery, no more, no more uh, genetic interventions here, you're going to have to die. But now the thinking is that this is a, 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 a very, very, um, could be a very productive period in your life because it's, it's the period when you can heal broken relationships in your family or with your friends, people who don't speak to you, have not spoken for decades, at the end of life can experience the healing. I forgive you. And so people will talk about the final tasks of living. Well, one of them is forgiveness. I forgive you. Or somebody comes to the person who's dying and says, please forgive me. I apologize. I didn't mean to hurt you. Or I didn't mean to hurt you. You hurt me and I wanted you to feel what I feel. And so on. And so It's been 10, 20, 30 years we haven't talked. I want you to know I'm sorry. You are, after all, my uncle, father, brother, etc., son. And, and doing that. So Lear is saying, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare understood this profoundly, the power of forgiveness to heal people, to make them whole, give up the resentment, for God's sake, give it up. How long has it been? What did the person do? I bet you don't even know what he did. I bet you forgot. You didn't pay back the loan. So you've hated him for 20 years, and now you got an ulcer, and so on. Um, so I, I think this is a, an extraordinary scene, an extraordinary moment, and it's a moment that lasts only two or three minutes, because shortly after this, Edmund has Lear, uh, sends Lear and Cordelia uh, off to execution. So this man has five minutes in which he is fully alive. He is alive in a way he has never been alive, and he's 88 or so years old. Alive! He, he is excited to be with his daughter. And what they're doing is saying, bless me, bless me. When you say, when you say bless me, what you are saying to the person is, may your connection to the sources of life intensify. May your May you be more alive. It's you. Bless you. And if you say, God bless you, what you're saying is, you want that, but you also want your connection to divinity to be intensified. Aliveness. He gets it. In this moment, he gets it. And he's got it for five minutes. And then she's hanged, and he kills the soldier who hangs her, and then he comes back in the last scene. So, my reading of, uh, of the play is uh, different from many people who think this is a very pessimistic play. I do not, do not at all, that he is alive here. 
he is alive. And he's, he's experienced something he never has experienced in, in the play, it is obvious, and we could speculate in his whole life, because he's been so self-absorbed. Me, I want affluence, I want power, I want control here. At the end of life, you have no control. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's a prison. We, too, will sing in the birdcage, like two birds in a cage, alive. Um, at the end of the play, there is one short-lived triumph for Lear. He, he, he revised, his revised narrative transforms him. Lear learns that the conditions of life do not ultimately matter, whether they are advanced or reversed. What matters is what Gloucester says, what Gloucester calls ripeness. Ripeness, that is, the capacity to engage life exactly, exactly as it shows up, moment by moment. The readiness to engage other people exactly the way they show up, without their having to change or get better or transform or be more whatever. Readiness. And the lines are spoken by, the readiness is all, the lines are spoken by Edgar when his father, the blinded Gloucester, wants to die. And, he's, he, and he says, come, come, Father, come with me. King Lear has lost. We have to go and seek protection. And, and Gloucester says, no, no, just let me stay here and die. And he says, what? What? In sad spirits again, men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Ripeness is all. Being ripe. Being ready. Powerful powerful distinctions here in this play. Here's how to live. You got a choice. You can spend your time complaining about everything that's wrong, or you can be right. That's what Shakespeare is saying, I would argue, humbly. Um, exactly, the engagement. In that ripeness, Peripatia loses its sting. When Lear recognizes the broken and vulnerable places in Kent, in the Fool, in Tamil Bedlam, in his own daughter Cordelia, and feels compassion for those broken places, he also glimpses the fractures in himself. It is in narrative that we become members of human society, and it is in narrative that we summon the humanity of others and ourselves in facing the pain of living and dying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So always does it to me. Always does it to me. Damn it. I had to give up my hair, but I don't care. <laughs> I'd rather be bald, but be able to, to have the experience of having my hair set on fire. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy to answer any, any uh, questions or any observations, anything that you want to bring up. How many people are taking Shakespeare now? Wow! You came to this and you're not in a Shakespeare court? I am impressed. That is extraordinary. There was a... Uh, there is a film of uh, Julius Caesar and, and uh, Marlon Brando is uh, Mark Antony in that. And I showed it in one class. And uh, Brando uh, was amazing to watch him. Work. He's 23 years old. It's on the comes He becomes Mark Anthony. And, uh, there was a person sitting in the first row who, when the lights came on, was asleep. And I said, Madam, wake up! How could you possibly be asleep? This was an Academy Award presentation. Oh, I'm so tired. I said, listen, you just missed a life-changing experience in watching this play. And so um, I demand that, that you take this, this uh, DVD home and watch it and come back and we'll talk about it. So any um, comments, anything? So would you say she was unripe? <laughs> she was certainly unripe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Unripe. It's the echo. It's what, ha it's what Hamlet says. Ready, this is all. Same thing in, at the end of that play. Mm -hmm. This is right, this is all. Mm. It's be, uh, being open to that existential moment. It's unrepeatable. It's just, it's not going to come around again. Mm. You could spend your time waiting for the conditions to be per perfect. They will never be. Right now. Can you be in this moment? Right now. Even if your back hurts. Even if you're worried about the paper that you have to submit. 
even if you're worried about some problem, you can, you can be here. Here. That's what he's talking about. Here. This moment. Alive. Blessings. Blessings and forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard. For me, it's very, very hard. God, I find it the hardest thing in the world to do. Forgive you. You hurt me. You know what I want to do to you? And the little voice inside is saying, Would you forgive. Forgive. Revenge. Right. <laughs> Revenge is what I'm saying. Yeah. Any, anything at all you want to talk about? The shameless plug, the Hillbury Theater will be doing it next semester. How wonderful. Oh. Lear, ah, oh, how wonderful. That is great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Do you uh, go see a lot of Lears? Uh, I, I've seen, uh, up at Stratford in Canada, I, I've seen, I've seen the, uh, Ian McKellen as Lear, both uh, on the stage. And they, uh, he's extraordinary. But Olivier is. Uh, Olivier. Olivier waited until he was... Um, facing death to do Lear. And he has cancer. He has extraordinary performance. And you know, he's one of the actors who disappears into the character. Do you want to know, you know, you see him, it's like, it's like Brando in The Godfather. That's The Godfather, it's not Marlon Brando. That's The Godfather, he becomes the character. Olivier is the same kind of actor. He became. Uh, is that on DVD? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. DVD. DVD there, DVD. and McKellen, McKellen too. Oh, they might not know who Olivier is. Do you guys know? Uh, yes. They don't. Uh, Lawrence. Oh, yeah, Lawrence Olivier. Yeah. yeah you know, great classical actor. But McKe McKe McKellen also has this wide range. He was, I mean, you got to see this. He was Dumbledore in Harry Potter. Did you ever watch Michael Pennington? Uh, I, know, I know that one. No, but I have to, is that the one you like? Oh, that's the only one I've seen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the only reason, I, my brother was in it. Oh. And he played uh, Burgundy? Burgundy. Oh, yeah, the Duke of Burgundy. Yeah. yeah, so I went and saw that. Oh. That's the one we wanted. Wow. It was good, though. It was good. Yeah. Oh, great. Wow. Your brother was in it with? With Michael Pennington. Wow. Your brother's an actor. Yeah. Oh, Aspiring. That's what? Aspiring. He's waiting tables yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, listen, that's the story. Everybody does that. You. And 75,000 other people are auditioning for the play. I know. I know. But people who love it, I am just. Yeah. Good. So, I mean, any, anything you want to talk about? Um, would you see any aspect of this play? You want to talk about hospitality in, in Shakespeare? My God, it is here. You know, it is here, always. And the real meaning of hospitality, how important it is. Well, you know that in some, in some cultures it's very important to show hospitality. You know, when you go someplace, you bring something, and I mean, people are, some people have very elaborate rituals, and other people don't. But it's, it, it is that idea of creating safety. You can be safe, you can be, it's when, when, you, when you have a friend, what your friend does is to create hospitable space for you to be yourself. That's why you love being with your friend, because you don't have to don't have to be afraid. You don't have to say, oh God, you say the wrong thing here. Your friend just is there for you. And you are there for your friend. Hospitality. Mm. I'm sorry you didn't give this this talk before Thanksgiving. Yeah, ah, right. Oh, oh my God, yes, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, great for me. Oh, well, we've got the holidays. Yeah, we've got Well, Christmas is coming. Yeah. And there's another, lots of opportunities for that kind of reconciliation yeah. and yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. 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 Be hard to, the hardest thing, I think. You know, in a way, you know, for me, in a way you could say, you know, that there's, there's one, in Christianity, there really is only one rule. That's the only rule. You know what, anybody know how it's expressed in Christianity? This is the hardest thing of all. Love, who do you have to love in Christianity? Your neighbor. Your neighbor, yes? More. Who do you have to love? Who? You love your enemies. Oh. And that's at that point you want to say, listen, God, I need to talk to you. What do you mean love your enemies? That's crazy. How can you love it? That's, that's what it is. And that is the great challenge. Okay, can give give Dr. Rasp some love. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.